you think about the past two years, one of the most unifying things, supply chain difficulties. Every single one of us has been uh, affected by this. So how are you using automation to kind of take on these issues? Yeah, I'm a big time. Thank you for, for that question and, and glad to be here. Um, supply chain um, in general is very, um, you know, in the left, right, and center if you, if you look at last year, but always been, and especially if you look at the pharma companies, um, supply chain is very critical, right? Because we, not only that we have to manufacture all the medicines, but they need to be delivered on time to all the patients worldwide. Um, so focus has always been the cost of goods to make sure that we automate um, enough so that we leave or keep the cost down for our medicines, but then also making sure that we are driving it towards uh, the customers and the, our patients faster. So a lot of work has been done. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of work is happening in terms of uh, IoT aspect of it, so making sure that we're automating um, every, every sensor um, that are there in, in, our, in our manufacturing units and making sure that we're leveraging our data platform that we are building to build that intelligence on it so we are proactively monitoring all our, all our uh, devices. We are predictively uh, solving the problem before it happens. So a lot more work is gonna be done there, but last two years actually because of pandemic has been accelerated big time. Awesome, thank you so much. And Amy, I think it's interesting, a lot of us here are B2B folks, but you know, you're working to make automation benefit your customers at Dix. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so at Dick's Sporting Goods, during the pandemic, we had to shut down the stores. And it was really a moment where we were grateful for having invested heavily in technology and the infrastructure. Because we were able to turn our stores into 800 mini um, distribution centers, basically. Uh, which was, again, a way to make sure that the product was a lot closer to the customer or athlete, as we call all of our customers. And I think the key thing there is to look in advance, right? It's not a matter of will the rainy day come? The rainy day, unfortunately, will come. And in this case, because the customers could no longer go into the store, we had to use the, the stores as those distribution centers. So leveraging the automation that was already in place, lever leveraging the back-end systems, and making sure that the customer or the athlete was still getting the service they required because a lot of us got outside. A lot of us did more active things in that period. Awesome. And now, Jerry, I know that you have said and written about how there were a couple of years where automation kind of slowed down. Maybe it plateaued. Not anymore, right? Yeah. New things are possible. Like what? Right. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, welcome to my hometown, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's great to be able to walk here and see all these folks here coming out, so thanks. So yeah, automation has been around as long as like, uh, us humans have used tools to make our jobs easier. And you know, right back, if you look in Wikipedia, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, patents on very clever automation techniques like in steam engines, making sure they don't blow up or you know, boil over with kind of intelligent gauges, and, et cetera. So we, we've been automating for a very long time, right up in, in, until recently. But I would say over the last decade, but certainly over the last five or, uh, or so years, you know, a, a wave of data in this digital world. You can't do anything without being digital, which is wonderful. Ordering a pizza to telemedicine and everything in between. So how do we deal? Us humans cannot cope with the volume of, of data, but we should. And this is where automation, so we, automation has started getting stuck because of that. And there were certain things in the enterprise that were just very difficult, interacting with, with other humans, getting broader views across the disparate business and IT data pool. So along comes artificial intelligence. <laughs> Boom, now the, the, that little road bump, is we're, we're over it and all, AI is opening up AI-powered automation is opening up a whole set of new windows of opportunity in the enterprise for automation. Benefit, us consumers. I, I guess I'm an athlete, I would say now. If, <laughs> by your definition, I'm a customer of Dick's, so I'm an athlete. <laughs> so it's, it's all, we're all the benefit. Awesome. Dicks. Yeah, <laughs> just go to Dick's and you're an athlete. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and Troy, at Sineos, obviously healthcare, quite regulated industry, research, quite regulated. How can automation help all of these compliance issues, all of the processes of that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Senior's Health, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of work with automation and uh, with the advent of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. it's really helped us move the needle. And the pandemic actually has forced, you know, for all the bad things about the pandemic, it's forced a shift in the acceptance of technology 
within the life science space. Um, so we're able to use that now, and we have had to do so over the past two years, using data uh, to make decisions. So uh, using that, uh, showing the benefit and the quality that comes out of that, you, can, you get less mistakes through automation. Um, our regulata regulators are actually seeing the benefit of doing so, mm -hmm. and it's actually driving a lot of efficiency going forward and helping our organization get rid of a lot of administrative tasks and let our, our really highly skilled resources do much higher value tasks. So it's been very, very beneficial. And has there been maybe an advance in recent years that allowed you to kind of accelerate the automation of these more administrative compliance tasks? Yeah, so if I take an example of some of the things we've been doing at our company, uh, if you look at our some of our highly skilled resources like uh, clinical research associates, uh, a lot of the tasks they do are very administrative. So they'll go to a site, they'll have to gather documents, and those documents have to be put into what's called a trial master file. Mm -hmm. So typically they'd be on a site, have to scan those documents into a scanner, they'll get them received into their email, and then they have to go back and process them again. Open up each one uh, and actually submit it into another platform. So through automation, we can actually do some sort of OCR, actually digitize that document and get the data out of it for further use, but also apply the appropriate metadata to those documents and automatically file it in there. So those same highly skilled resources can do the things that are more important, like patient care and, and working with the site staff. That's awesome. I think we all remember the uh, pre-OCR era, mm. and it was <laughs> yeah. dark time. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes. Um, so another question of automation is always, what processes are worth automating? How do you really make sure that you are actually making these systems work well and you're not just making inefficient things move faster? And Agum, I know you have done work on kind of making sure that different automated processes work together. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think uh, just first, I think what you said is very, very critical, that doing the wrong thing faster doesn't <laughs> help. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's very important that everybody invest enough time to understand that what they are actually targeting automating. And actually, the best way to do that is to work closely with the business. So I think, you know, Troy was saying, actually, I can relate to it exactly in the R&D or, or finance or HR. You can pretty much go across the board business to corporate application, and you can find these repetitive tasks that can be automated to make it faster, but make sure that they are being all, you know, working through the business, that they are the right thing to do before you put any automation behind them. Now, one of my, uh, you know, mission of life is that and this is a very close and dear and near my heart, uh, the whole intelligent automation, what I'm calling it almost like a intelligent and smart automation for me, is that if you look at every organization, you will have a self-service automated platform, something that actually giving people to use self-service. You probably have something that's working as an automation from, from a bot's perspective, something there. And there's something like a process mining aspect of it, and on and on and on. And what I'm driving in GSK, and, and my definition of intelligent automation is that how do I really create this connected ecosystem of automation? How can I really make one plus one is three to get the most value and benefit out of the automations? How can I really take a self-service environment, connect that with um, my process mining tool, and the outcome what can be then can create a robot that can actually automate to deliver the pieces, rather than individually done in isolation aspect of it. So building, and I think industry is moving too, I mean, if you, if you talk to some of these large providers without naming them, uh, you will see that they are thinking that way the same way. Like, how do we really create this connected ecosystem of automation to build the smartness? And then we have the enterprise data platform, which is kind of state-of-the-art, um, you know, a mesh-based harmonized data platform, where we can then put all this data to then mine it and apply the machine learning and AI aspect of it to get even most value out of it. So that's something that I'm, I'm driving uh, pretty uh, significantly in GSK right now. Awesome, thank you. And Amy, how do you think about which processes are worth automating when it comes to the customer athlete experience? Um, that's a great question, and just to sort of play off what you're saying, the last thing we wanna do is do bad things more quickly, right? Um, and I think back to my first exposure to AI where somebody introduced me to the concept of um, chihuahuas versus blueberry muffins. I don't know if you all have, have done that. We'll excuse you to Google that really quickly because it's worth a look. And it, it basically talks about the complexity of AI and how hard it is to do some things that humans can do more naturally. We can tell the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. Um, however, AI script, it's incredibly complex to do that. 
So at Dick's Sporting Goods, we like to look and see what is it that we can do to create a true omni-channel experience, as we call it in retail. So we believe in the in-store, online, and in the app. And we're trying to figure out how do we partner your experience with a, a teammate that can help you get the most out of it. So one example would be, in our stores, you can go and get these very cool sensors. You can go get hooked up mm -hmm. um, in a system called Gears, and it'll check your golf mm -hmm, swing. Mm -hmm. I'm left-handed, so forgive mm -hmm. my, my bad swing there. Um, but they, they put you in these sensors, but a teammate guides you through the experience. So it's not just you're going and playing a video game where you swing and then it tells you how to get better. You swing a couple times and then data reads whether your hips are out of alignment, whether you're pulling back too far, et cetera. And a teammate helps walk you through that. So that's a case where we really try to partner that teammate experience to give our athletes the best possible experience plus an automated experience to be able to do and see these subtle motions of the hip and the swing that a, a Athlete, um, a teammate couldn't exactly see just on their own. So that combination of an automated process plus a teammate, we think is where the secret sauce is. And that way you don't go down the path of confusing chihuahuas and blueberry muffins. <laughs> so, so and fun. do you have a sense, um, when you offer this, you say omni-channel experience where it's online, mixed with in-store, does this help customer retention? Well, what's the impact? Absolutely, because I think we all want the same experience. We want the joy that we get from, I just want this right now. We want that same experience in store. And we've even done that in the stores with a, another tool we have called Shoe Runner. So you can go into the store, and while you're waiting on um, a teammate to help you, you can take a shoe, scan it, and it'll tell you if the size is there, if it's at a close by store, they'll make a recommendation, which is the same experience we've come to expect online. We want our, our robot overlords to tell us if uh, there's a better shoe for us, if there's a better fit, where's the closest mm -hmm. one? Um, and whenever you partner that with a in-store you know, support of a customer service, you kind of have the be best of all worlds. So we want the joy of shopping with somebody telling us, yeah, that, that shoe is not for you, with the same, like, where, where's the inventory? If we can get those two things, kind of no matter where you are, if you're in your sport playing it, you want to better your best, if you're in the store, you want what you want, and if you're online, you'd like to know where that, that shoe is and when it's gonna get there. Absolutely. And Jerry, I know you have spoken about there are certain environments that you think with the new era of automation are just ripe. You know, wh what do you think about? Yeah, so I, I think when you think about automation and, and AI, there are amazing tools like process mining tools to really turn the lights on. Like we tend to operate in the, in, in, in the dark and if you've been like me in IT as long, um, your, your, your spidey senses, you trust them almost t too much. And but getting that data is, is, is vital and process mining takes the guesswork out. And, 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 but, but that's just the starting point. The interesting thing is the fertilizer for automation is more diverse data. The water to water your automation to have it sprout and grow is integration. Integrating, you said one plus one equals three. So one example, how, how many of you are delighted when you go to the Department of Motor Vehicle to, <laughs> come on. Well, I, I am not BSing. Here in North Carolina, when you engage, and, and the pandemic has only fertilized this more, is a delightful experience through their conversational AI interface. And it's not just a chatbot. And it's, it's think about the fertilizer and the water, right? So more data is better. I go to register and it says, remembering my past history where I didn't, um, I didn't have my car inspected before I went. And I had to kind of like, you know, go, go back to go. And mean, meanwhile, I'm a very cheerful bot I'm dealing with the whole time. I'm, this time I'm asked right away to make sure I get my car inspected. But more diverse data. You have a Tesla, Model 3, I highly recommend them, very economical. But data shows from perhaps tireact.com that you're going to fail your inspection because your rear tires probably need to be swapped out and changed. I'm like, I've only had the car for a couple of years. So it, fit, it says, like, go back to go. So I go downstairs with, the, with my phone and flashlight and I look at the, my rear tires and lo and behold, they're, you know, as rounded as they come. So think about that, that getting the more data, but integration, because now I'm using third party so sources. 
And when I finally get down and do the job I wanted to do, register my car, it's done. There's no guesswork. There's no oh, go, go. It's all well done and informed. And it's, it's a delightful, expe delightful experience <laughs> at the DMV. Nothing wrong with that. No one thought hey? that was coming. Right? <laughs> so these are the types of things. Knowing your process is, is a good start, but it's not sufficient. You need that fertilizer, diverse data, water it to grow, integrating with external systems. Awesome. And thinking about diverse data, thinking about the data that comes from automation, right, that we can maybe get new insights that we wouldn't have done by hand, right? So, Troy, kind of what have you seen when it comes to the data that results from automation? What are you excited about? Uh, I mean, I can go back to the example I gave you before, you know, when, when we digitize those documents that are being mm -hmm. collected, it, it's part of an overall process for clinical trials. And that data usually is something we can use to trigger either an upstream or a down stream system to do another action. Uh, it also helps us, as an example, a typical uh, collection document you get would be a CV. Mm -hmm. And it's a required document for a clinical trial, for a PI, or a primary investigator. And if you already have that data there and you go to do another study, um, and that PI is going to be working on that study as well, you can flag that that content is already there. So again, you just drive more efficiency through something you already did. So it's very, very valuable from that perspective. And then if you can take the other data sources that are there that you can mine within your organization from third-party data and internal opera operationalized data, um, we can do better prediction as well. Mm -hmm. So what's your best bet as far as getting site selected, patient recruitment, and where should you head from that perspective? And using that data and algorithms, you can actually understand whether or not you're falling behind or you're way ahead of that curve and make the proper adjustments. So it's, it's very, very valuable. Awesome. Thinking about proactive detection, Agum, I know you have said that you're able kind of to see these problems before they present themselves when it comes to automation with data. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we are uh, applying the, the smart or intelligent op um, automation, including the data platform that we have that has the capability, right? Um, is that we, we run a large operations in the organization, right? And, and, and most of it actually outsourced uh, for the right reason like everybody else. However, uh, if you look at our operations right from R&D um, to our um, uh, supply chain and the commercial organization, these are very critical functions. So any outages happening either manufacturing site or happening commercial site or impacting our molecule discovery or development is a huge business and patient impact. So we're looking the ways to then mine uh, some of this data that we have and applying the automation to see if we can predict a failure of the system. So, and, and, and understanding that maybe, like you said, tire, similarly like see if this, this, this file system situation or the high utilization of the system or in a specific day and time and something runs together, cause these issues that we can actually predict and proactively remove it through automation, right? So without any human intervention, can we apply those pieces? And, and we're seeing the, some of the success there, but a lot more work needs to be done because it, it, is, it is something that actually, if not done right, can create actually much, much complex issues in the environment. So we are, we are taking it uh, slowly, but that's something that actually can really take, not only take the cost out, but also improve the quality and resiliency of the system and then actual impact on our business and our patient will be tremendous. So a lot of work is happening there as well. Nice. And so when thinking about automation, I think one of the most knee-jerk reactions you get is fear, right? The robots are gonna take my jobs, <laughs> right? Um, and especially as we kind of head into an environment that some fear is recessionary, how do we make sure that automation actually works for workers, right? How to make sure that it helps people? And Amy, so how are you kind of hearing this and how are you thinking about trying to make sure that automation works for everybody? That's a great question. Um, I think we, and it's sort of playing on your, let's not do inappropriate processes more quickly mm -hmm. and experiences with the DMV or in health, right? We all want a better experience. We want to be known as a customer, athlete, patient. Um, I think it's reassuring people that we're going to take the work you don't want to do, the processes that are boring, that it, you have hoped would not be yours to deal with, and we're going to automate those processes. And one of the ways we do that at Dick's Sporting Goods is everything from hosting hackathons to find out 
what problems can we solve to engaging our store teammates to listening to our athletes so you you can crowdsource it and then people are involved in the process and it makes us all part of how we want this experience to be better and look for the processes that are so repetitious that no one truly wants to do it nobody wants to wait in line at the DMV you know no one wants to wait in at their doctor's office or for their medicine to not go to the appropriate place so when we find that there are places where it's naturally um, given to human error or it's a matter of it's just so repetitious that we would rather something uh, a bot handle it so that we can do something more interesting and a great way to do it is to reach out to your employee base because rather than it make an us versus them it makes we're all in this together to improve yep. because our center our, our center of excellence is about serving the athlete or the customer yep. awesome so can I add to that absolutely yeah. well, one of the things and, 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 and I love what you said there and what I'm hearing in that is also trust. Mm. And with anything automation or AI related, that this piece of software is gonna do this mundane job that I was doing so I can do something of higher value. Who's culpable if it doesn't go right? <laughs> the piece of software, the vendor, you know, IBM for, for producing the, the, the software. So how do you gain trust in that bot that it's gonna do? Now, as you get to more regulated industries, this, this now matters, you can't say, mm, you know, it was the bot, <laughs> you know, we messed up that, that prescription or, or, or whatever. So trust is key. And in IBM back, you know, I, I've never worked on a mainframe at IBM, but I've learned so much from the folks who have. And they've been doing intelligent workload management on the mainframe, and we learned this little trick from, from them, and we pushed it into IBM automation. It's the three-step trust-building process. Step one is to alert uh, and, and inform which is, hey, I, I, I see something that, that's worth noting, and so it's an alert, with an explanation. Right? So explainability is the key to trust. Then the next step, step two, is alert, explain, but then show what you would do to automate it, to, to rem remediate it. Don't do it, but just show what you would do. Trust is being built. And then put down at the bottom a button Go ahead, do it for me. <laughs> Just go ahead, I, you know, I read it, I get it, go do it. Now you're training the system as well. The third one is fully autonomous autopilot mode, which is you gain that trust. Now, depending on the, in, the importance in, of, of that work, I hear back lessons from, fr from the IBM mainframe group that it can take up to 10 years sometimes to build trust for a piece of software that's operating on a mission critical system. Now, of course, you know, the, the DMV bot may not be that, you know, we'll, we'll fix it in real time and use an agile process. But things that get more regulated could take more time to build that trust. So the biggest fear I hear is, 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 is around, is this thing may or may not take my job, but it better do it right. <laughs> <laughs> How do I trust it? And I think there's a formula for that. Awesome. When thinking about building trust, Troy, I'm wondering how you have kind of approached this. I know that you have done a great job in your organization of kind of spreading the good word of how AI can help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just tagging on to what each of the three of my colleagues here have said, it, it's true, trust, trust is key, because most people with any change, and especially with automation, they're assuming they're gonna lose their job. And I think I've seen it on one of the other events like this where uh, somebody had said, people don't actually lose their job, they go into higher value uh, task is what happens. So the, the key to it really, and I like what you said, it's about explaining why the decision's made, allowing the person to make the decision as you get to prescriptive kind of outputs. Um, but you need champions in the business. The people that you're ch making the change to, they have to understand why you're doing it, what the benefit is to them, and what the benefit is to the company overall. And once you have those people engaged and understanding that, they're the biggest advocates you mm -hmm. can have. They will drive that change in the organization. It works very, very well. Go ahead. No, I, I think I completely agree with Troy. I think the, the business alignment is so critical that they're looking at the value they're coming out of it, whether it's a cost, time, or quality, right? Because repetitive tasks, those three things. But even for the employees, I think it's very important that very purposefully that you do a skill transformation implementation in the organization. Yep. You can't sweep away something that they do and then give it to somebody else to do it. So I think every time, I think that's one thing in the, as an industry, as leaders, we sometimes miss it that, and, and we are doing that in GSK, I, I think pretty much everything and anything that we're trying to bring, bring in, 
that we purposefully drive the skill transformation, like upskill, like the point, steer yeah. the people that this is where you need to, so forget about what you've been doing all these last years. This is what needs to be done and, and kind of up your skill from doing the mundane task to actually working in the software engineering to automate these pieces, right? So it is very important that the, the employees understand and everybody line up behind it that they see the value as well, along with the business. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot tougher and uh, you know, difficult uh, climb. Absolutely. And Amy, you know, when cash is tight, obviously it was not a super easy year for retail, uh, last, especially 2020. How do you kind of advocate maybe against internal skepticism that this really is gonna help? Um, and just absolutely playing off what you were saying, I think it's a matter of change management. I think that you, A, invest in what you save in these operational costs and innovation, and you invest for the future. So uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, that example I gave right off the top, the fact that when the pandemic came, we had to shut the stores down because of those long-time, overtime investments, we were able to rely on automated processes and not only people. So we were able to, again, in partnership, people plus process, led us to um, great stability and to be able to stay in service of our, our athletes. So I think when you, when you build that sort of trust and the other investment, even when times are tight, um, I would advocate for a change management process practice within. I actually, as part of my job function, run change management within a tech organization. And people may think, oh, soft skills, you know, uh, amongst the amongst the, the hard coding skills. But that, that combination is key. It, it teaches us how to build trust. It creates those champions. So I think that even though these things may seem extra or soft or these other words that we use to budget cut and set them aside, they can be the most important things because it prepares you for those harder times so that you can deliver value through. Right. Jerry. One. Yeah. One technology and automation that's exciting you the most. What's emerging that you think, man, this is awesome, more people need to know? Yeah, so one, geez, okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I actually, I, I, I really enjoy looking across, you know, as I said, one plus one equals three, th that, that scenario. And, and for whatever reason, business automation and IT automation, there's like a, a, a great divide between the two. So we're doing work around this topic called biz ops or business operations, which I think really excites me because it starts to look across both business and IT. So a quick example of, of what we're seeing. So picture it's, it's thunderstorms are predicted in the Atlanta, Atlantic, um, Atlanta area. And on the environmental telemetry side, a bot is now predicting that this is gonna, these thunderstorms are gonna slow things down in the, at the airport. And a business automation bot then who has access to your backend systems sees how many flights are gonna be delayed and how many passengers, right? So that is now passing it down an automation pipeline, enriching it with insights and data to a, um, an, an SRE bot that then goes ahead and says, you know, there's a 200% rebooking demand that I predict. So let me start automating some writing of ServiceNow tickets to deploy some new instances of rebooking apps. So what you have is prediction of weather, increased capacity for your rebooking application on demand. Result, happy customer, well, as happy as they're gonna get, <laughs> right? It would have been worse on that, but maybe you can now offer them with that advance notice some, some free dinner tickets or <laughs> Etc. So that bridging the gap between business IT and the machine learning models that are looking across business telemetry and IT telemetry, I think is one of the most exciting things to come up because it's, it's, there's, that's the next bump in the road. And I think AI can, could, could flatten that bump out too. Well, that's awesome. Thank you all so much. Can we get a hand for our panelists? <laughs> awesome.